Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. Uh, quick announcement before we dive into the details of this episode with uh, Brian Brooks from Idaho Wildlife Federation. It's an important episode. It's an important topic. Uh, as you may or may not know, uh, Representative Clyde out of Georgia has introduced a uh, piece of legislation called the Return Act to basically gut the Pittman-Robertson Act that has an 85-year history of funding wildlife conservation for outdoorsmen and sportsmen. This has been the essence of uh, what a big part of our argument for hunting has been for a very long time. I don't know any outdoorsman that isn't proud of the fact that we provide the majority of the funding for hunting, fishing, wildlife conservation, and habitat improvements, and all these things that go into what uh, it comes out of this this uh, Pittman-Robertson Act that was signed into law by President Roosevelt in 1938. It's a very important topic. It's an unacceptable thing to allow these politicians to gut this bill. It's unnecessary. It's wildly inaccurately portrayed. It is gross and disgusting that we're even having to discuss this, and I am totally caught off guard by the introduction of this bill and I want to fight against it and I I hope you join me in it because this is a huge part of who we are. We care about our wildlife. We care about their habitat and the conservation efforts that make it the success story that it has been. The Pittman-Robertson Act has funded us billions of dollars. Like I said, almost nine decades and it is just simply unacceptable to stand by and let this happen. So we're going to talk about this and the details, and I hope you guys are into it and pay attention to it and, and take some action with this because it's a it's a very important thing for us as hunters. Um, and, and Brian Brooks does a fantastic job at explaining this. Before we get there, I want to make a correction from last week's episode where we were talking about butchering your animals um, and, and your wild game meat and all that stuff with Mike Edgehouse. Well, what I did is uh, my buddy down in Boise who owns Get Your Meat LLC. His name is Andy Donsero. And I, for some reason, well, I know why I did it. I called him Dan. And I just wanted to correct that. It's not Dan. Uh, I was thinking, you guys know how I have trouble sometimes pronouncing people's last name. And I was like stressing out about his last name. It's actually, it's, it's Donsero. And, but I was thinking Dancero and Dan. And so Dan popped out of my mouth and, and that's what I said. And I, I mispronounced his name. And so I, I apologize to him to that. I hate it when I do stuff like that. It's, uh, it's frustrating, but, uh, I just wanted to make that correction, uh, that, uh, it's Andy with get your meat LLC, uh, the butcher of choice for the Boise area. If you guys are uh, down there and need a, uh, any kind of butchering services, he's he's a great guy. Uh, you're going to get your own meat back. Uh, it's somebody that has a lot of experience doing this. It's a quality butcher that uh, if I were in that area, that's definitely who I would use. So again, to my buddy Andy, I apologize for, uh, for uh, saying your name wrong last week. And uh, hopefully that fixes that, brother. You guys, let's get to the show. Enjoy it. Here we go. There exists a threat from anti-hunting groups to politicians trying to give our land away, and we won't stand for it. Those vast western landscapes provide the space for our wildlife to thrive and a place for hunters and anglers to fuel the fire that sparks their soul. In this show, we share our love of hunting, fishing, and conservation. Here, we provide the foundation to meet these threats through passion and the grit of the American outdoorsman. Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Western Huntsman Podcast. This is Jim Huntsman, your host, coming at you from the Broken Tan Studio right here in Clark Fork, Idaho. Sunny, hot, and warm Clark Fork, Idaho, I might add. Uh, Guys, this week we're going to be talking uh, a little bit about this uh, legislation that has been introduced out of Georgia um, from a, I, I believe Congressman Clyde, if I'm, if I'm remembering that right. Anyway, I've got somebody that's, uh, actually, you know, you know, an expert on this kind of stuff where I'm just kind of a, you know, uh, misquoting, mispronunciation, uh, kind of guy. So this week I've got my buddy who is, uh, the, you are the executive director. Am I saying that right, Brian? 
<laughs> that is uh, that is how it's pronounced. Exactly I kind of I, I kind of drew uh, I, I kind of drew a blank there for a second. <laughs> I'm like I I know you're like uh, you, you know whatever it is, but it's a, the executive director <laughs> of the Idaho Wildlife Federation. Brian Brooks is joining me this week, and Brian, for those of you who may not know. Uh, he's been on the show um, once or twice. I can't remember. You, have, you've been on twice, haven't you? I, I think I've been on once, but it was such a great conversation that it probably occupies two more spaces in your brain than the one time. Yeah, that could be. <laughs> it, you had such a profound impact. I feel like you've been on like all the time. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this this is uh, this is perfect. I I've uh, Brian and I have had a lot of conversations over the last few years um as as I, I sit on the board of the IWF and it's it's a great organization and Brian does a fantastic job he's always kind of leading the charge on some of these issues and he's kind of my go-to guy when uh some especially something like this where because Brian is in the fray every day this is this is what he does for a living so when when pieces of legislation like this come up uh, Brian is a is a really good resource, and uh, I, I've uh, learned to trust his his wisdom on on these kind of issues uh, for a long time, and he, he knows how to go about this stuff strategically very well as well. So, Brian, I appreciate you joining me the sh- on the show, man. Shoot, what what an introduction! Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, uh, um, you know that is what the Idaho Wildlife Federation does. We're the oldest and largest coalition of. Uh, hunting and fishing organizations in Idaho, and it's our job to just make uh, hunting and fishing better in our state. So this is uh, that that advocacy, that cutting edge of advocacy role is is our job um, in this kind of um, political arena for sportsmen and women. Yeah, yeah. So there's a uh, we we have like a big summer board meeting coming up, huh? We sure do. Oh yeah, a couple I, weeks. Are you ready? <laughs> I was gonna come down to Boise to see you guys for it, but. Um, I, I'm not sure. I I can't justify it, Mike, because I'd have to drive my diesel down there, and it, it would oh. like financially <laughs> kill me, man. <laughs> It'd be faster to maybe like get a plane ticket, or more cheaper to get a plane ticket. I know. I, it's, I know. It's, yeah, yeah. We've had to really think about our um, gas usage this summer for our fishing and camping trips. I I cannot blame you, but if you ever made it down, I'll make it worth your while. I can put you on some trout and some other uh, warm water species if you really if you were able to come down here and swing it. Okay, so that's pretty enticing. That's pretty enticing. Oh yeah. I'm I'm uh I've had a I've had a I started the year off really well fishing wise, and then it kind of lagged off once bear season hit. And so I'm that slacking, happens. man. I need to I need to make up for some lost time. Oh yeah, you know I, I there's there's some great fishing down here in the summer. I mean, gosh, Boise's 80 minute drive from a world class blue ribbon trout fishery on the South Fork of the Boise. You got the Oahe, which is technically Oregon. Um, but we also have, uh, you know, Lake Lowell, which is out in Nampa. We got CJ Strike, which you can get uh, great crappie days, hundreds of crappie in a day, bass fish. I mean, you, you can, Boise's, you know, Boise's got its problems like any uh, larger uh, metropolitan area. But uh, yeah. there, you can pretty much do everything hunting and fishing wise within an hour drive. Man, you are going to have some nasty emails coming your way for announcing all those <laughs> locations. Uh, <laughs> the locals down there are going to hear this. They're going to be like, what's this guy's address? <laughs> yeah, if, it's, uh, if, if, um, if anybody doesn't know about CJ Strike Reservoir uh, and they want to complain about me hotspotting that, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, you can at me and, and we'll see if there's anybody who doesn't know about that spot. <laughs> I know. I know. That's the funny part about it, man. Um, I, I took some flack actually this spring for uh, posting a picture of a fish that I that I'd caught. And it always amazes me. That that people think that these areas are this big secret that they're not. <laughs> like it's mm-hmm. not a secret, man. I'm not I'm not exposing anything here. Not not to mention I didn't even say the location, um, <laughs> or, or anything like that. But uh, I I do I do sometimes I I'm protective of that stuff and I'm very careful with that stuff. Like I it's just yeah. like you know if 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 I get an elk or a deer I'm not gonna say the location. It was the same with this fish, but um, people kind of have this perception that it's uh, a lot more secret than it, oh. than it really is but um anyway yeah there's like there's a fine balance to walk there there is and honestly as a as a sportsman advocacy organization in idaho we work on a number of campaigns that are very uh issue specific and i won't get into it yet because we are actually and we'll talk about it at our board meeting but we're trying to figure out a way to publicize we just want a major victory um in a certain large drainage and it's hard for us to talk about it. Essentially, it is one of the last best over-the-counter trophy elk 
tags left in the country. Um, and that's already sort of reducing it to a, a few places in Idaho. But mm -hmm. we, we managed to influence the outcome of a management decision with the Forest Service that will keep it a very productive trophy quality over the counter elk, uh, experience. And um, it's hard for us. How do we tell the general public that we did that, that we conserved that area without blowing it up? So um, yeah, you don't, it's, man. It's you just fine you, line. you tell your favorite podcast host what uh, what unit <laughs> and and give me some coordinates. No, <laughs> I've got my I've got my elk honey holes. I'm good. I'm I'm totally kidding. But uh, yeah, that is that that kind of does put you in a pickle, doesn't it? It really, yeah, it really does. We gotta. It's tough, man. But like, I'm really actually excited about that specific example and. Um, we're going to figure out how we can tell people, but, uh, yeah, it's like, how do you explain the good work that you do? And so often it is very tangible to like a specific on the ground spot without just like telling, you know, 10,000 people that this is a great elk hunting spot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I honestly, with all this stuff, I, I tire of the contention that, that mm -hmm. is surrounding hunting and fishing sometimes. And, you know the 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 infighting amongst hunters and and hunting organizations that don't agree and and I I grow I grow really tired of it uh, and I I don't know what do you see with that Brian like um, I know we're kind of off topic here but we'll sure. we'll get there uh, mm -hmm. because you're you're in this every day and and mm -hmm. I I'll give you a great example um, because it pertains to like IWF and I get put in the middle of like IWF and F4WM because they, <laughs> they have, they have differing views on things. But for me, I support both organizations and I believe both in both of them. Um, and it's, it's not just that I have, I have a buddy who, uh, actually this was a while ago, but it, it's still kind of to this point of, you know, he was like with the Mule Deer Foundation, and he just wanted to constantly talk smack about the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Th these are not the organizations actually mm -hmm. in this story, but I'm, I'm using them as an example. Um, what do you see with that? Do you have like a, a perceived outlook as to how that plays out in terms of conservation and how it, wh whether it, it helps or there's a negative impact or, uh, you oh. know, makes sense what I'm asking? Yes, yes, it does, because I live it and breathe it every day, and it's incredibly unfortunate. I'll, I'll start off with this. Um, as a professional rule and a personal rule, I believe if you have to talk smack about other people or organizations, you do not have enough good things to say about your own organization or your own self. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I get that it, people can get under our skin, political differences, everything's so super charged, polarized these days that it's hard to remain neutral like that. But yeah, from the insane. IWF, from yeah, from the IWF perspective, while I'm running it, there may be things that I see other organizations do, but we don't use our platform to go after them professionally. I will. I mean, it's just it's one of those things, and and it's because I see it every day. I mean, Jim, I. We're on a number of coalitions, collaboratives across the state. I'll just use the Pay It Forest Coalition. Mm -hmm. Pay It Forest Coalition is a group of interests that get together to figure out how we can all get the resources we we value out of the forest. So obviously, we represent the the, the hunting and fishing seat. There's miners, there's loggers, there's water interests, there's environmentalists, there's uh, motorized users. Everybody under the sand that uh, under the sun that enjoys that forest is welcome to this table, and there are some people we butt heads with people all the time but it's expected and we get a lot done it's in fact that coalition that setup with people around the table that we often disagree with from a philosophical understanding or maybe it may be just a trivial thing we come together and we can talk about things and we can get things done it's harder to get like-minded sportsmen together than it is to get that table of people together who have often who have diametrically differing, opposed that. yeah yep and and it is harder to get sportsmen together. And I, I don't know about the reasons why. Often there's personalities, there's egos, there's whatever. Um, but it's it starts with poor communication and poor communicators. And when I took over IWF, there was no real like umbrella group that big tent group that tried to bring sportsmen together. And that's something we're still trying to work on. And we don't need to all get along. We can be feel free to disagree, but it's those disagreements that I have seen that people latch onto to blow up and often yeah i have seen that disagreements are often misunderstandings and there's like oh actually it's, it's a much smaller disagreement than people may think but then it's like oh well i'm committed to not liking this guy and blah 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 like 
Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's a bummer. I, I don't know all the reasons why, but I will tell you that it, it is a, it is, it only hurts conservation. It only hurts us as hunters and anglers and trappers um, to collectively stand for the issues that we stand for. If you take, uh, you know, for instance, just, you know, some of these bills that come up in the Idaho legislature, luckily, you know, last year with the uh, lighted Knox expandable broadheads thing, Again, just going to state IWF doesn't have a stance on those specific issues, yeah. but we don't think that we should start politicizing our, you know, season setting, archery equipment, that kind of stuff, regulations. on it. We think that should stay with the commission and sportsmen, uh, not be politicized. But absolutely. Had, had we become had we had infrastructure in place where we were more unified, um, even if we were knew that there's things we're going to be disagreed on, we probably could have stopped that bill and talked to the representative and said, hey. You know, maybe we could actually get this through and we, and we tried our damnedest. We got the commission to say, OK, we will go through this. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we were kind of caught off guard. And and I, we are always striving at IWF to, to move people past their disagreements. And in like you said, with those examples of other organizations, these uh, there's some deep baggage held by sportsmen and sportsmen groups that go decades. Oh, back. Yeah. I mean, there was totally I'm not joking. I, I saw some throwaway comment on social media, and of course, this is just, you know, this is a social media, but um, <laughs> somebody brought up something that IWF did in the, in the, in the 70s. <laughs> They're like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, I was like, guys, I wasn't even a twinkle in my dad's eye in the 70s, so uh, I'm going to throw my hands up here and say, get over it, and let's work together on this other issue. Uh, it's it's wild, man. It is wild, and, and that's, that's where we, like you said, I think that the... Just like as a society, we tend to thrive on the negative shit. You know, mm-hmm. like like somebody will – there could be – let's say there's a restaurant and it has 10 reviews on the internet. Nine of them <laughs> are positive, but there's one negative review. People will focus on that negative review, and that's yep. that's where it's like this this restaurant is now demonized in their mind and not worth their time <laughs> and money. And, uh, you know, screw the, the, the nine positive results. How do we know that one person that wrote the negative review just didn't have their, you know, their britches in a bunch that day and, and it was having a bad day? It's just it's ridiculous. And I, I don't understand it. Uh, it. This has been a this has been a thing that um, has been kind of a constant theme on my show with mm-hmm. um, the, the constant negativity. And I'm not always perfect with that either. I'll, I'll tell you right now, I, lo- I lose my shit. Right. I mean, we, we all do. <laughs> Uh, but it, it is, uh, it, I just worry sometimes about our future because of this. And so mm-hmm. something, uh, I, I think that we're just going to continue having discussions about and finding, finding ways to smooth a lot of that out because uh, the, the most ridiculous arguments turn in at like, like, like pe- two people could be great friends outside of the fact that they disagree on what the best caliber to shoot an elk with is, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, it blows my mind. So speaking of that, you had a pretty good season last year. I, I want to kind of cover that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, considering my circumstances, I had an infant baby child, uh, come into my life. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, my wife and I, and so I, I didn't do the typical thing with my brothers that we, we usually go out and we do some, a pretty extended Frank church, um, hunt and, uh, just get away from it at all. And, um, this year I decided I should probably be somewhere near front country to, you know, be in contact with my wife. And I really, I had to like, it was kind of a fun challenge. I had to, what could I do, you know, surgically, like be very efficient with my time, all that. So I, I ended up going solo and uh, yeah, I ended up getting um, my personal best for mule deer, and I got a, a raghorn bull on the very last day of the season that I possibly could. Um, interestingly enough, like there were storms on the opening day of the deer season, which is when I got my deer. There was a storm on the last day, so um, <laughs> that's how it goes. Yeah, it was, I, you, yeah, yeah, of course, right. And, but it's it's kind of I don't know. It's it's changed my perspective on solo hunting. I the first bull. I ever got solo that I hiked out, took all day. I was like, well, I'm never doing that again, but it's cool to know that I had it in me. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And then last year it was my second bull I've ever got solo. And it was my second deer I've ever got solo. And now I'm kind of like digging it a lot more. It's, you know, I miss, I love hunting with my brothers. um, Yeah. And they're doing another deep trip, backcountry trip. And I, again, I couldn't justify it because my kid, I was only about a year old now, but, um, it's kind of it's a cool different experience you can i can be so much more nimble so much more fast and every mistake is on me every 
victory is on me. There's just, it's, um, it's a different way of hunting. You know, you're, 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 I really enjoy when you're, you see some elk and you want to make a play on them or deer, Mm -hmm. you at least have some other brains, some other folks to chat with, to figure out a strategy. I mean, it's all on you, you know, and, and, um, it's kind of fun to have a successful season, both for deer and elk. And just, I'll, I'll, you know, makes me feel good about myself. Yeah. Um, But, uh, I, you know, I'm actually, so I'm doing it again this year and I'm going to go a different place, but, uh, um, yeah, you're going to do solo. Go run. Oh yeah. Yep. Yep. I, I, uh, I, I don't know how to explain it to people that have never done any kind of like serious solo hunting, but that that's that's about 90% of what I do. Uh, mm-hmm. I've, I've got I've got a couple of family members and I've got a couple of buddies that I like to hunt with periodically. But mm-hmm. there – and I don't mean to like sound spiritual or anything, but there is something about being out there by yourself, making the decisions by yourself that in this, this individual connection that you get – when when you're by yourself and it's like just you against yep. the mountain, right? That it is, there's nothing else. There there, there is no uh, the, the, there's no team effort, and, and not that having a team effort is is a bad thing, but but when you're solo and it is just you against the mountain and you against that uh, the, the wildlife and and it's it's your decisions. You don't have to wonder if uh, your suggestion might sound like a mm-hmm. bad idea to your hunting partner, but they don't want to say anything. So they kind of go down with the ship. You know, I, I it's, mm-hmm. I don't know what it is. I just, uh, I, I really, really enjoy solo hunting. I always have, I've always, and honestly, I've always been more successful when I'm solo. Um, yeah, yep. Uh, yeah. I am far more successful. Uh, yeah, I like that idea of it's you against the mountain. There's, there ain't help coming from anywhere else. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's it's all on you. And, um, I mean, even it's just uh, I, I I've actually um, I track my hunts or my uh, you know my walks with um, on X. Uh-huh. I've looked at some of my hunts like I tend to walk um, thirty to fifty percent more further um, by yourself when I'm solo. Yeah, I just cruise, man. I, yeah, I, me I, too. I you know I'm one of those guys where I'll start hiking it you know, four thirty five, two, three hours before the sun rises so I can get up high and then I sit for two, three hours. Cause that's, you know, I think a lot of hunters that I go with are like, they want to move, move, move. I'm like, no, nah, man, you want to sit in glass for a while and see what's moving. But mm-hmm. aside from that first initial sit, I, I cover ground too. Um, yeah. It's just a different, it's a different kind of thing. I, I love it. I do too, man. I, I, and I don't know if that'll ever change. The, the, the one exception I've made recently is I've, I've uh, started taking my girls with me because um, mm-hmm. they're, they're old enough and, and they actually got their first bucks last year. Uh, both of them and they got their first turkeys this year. I tried to get them a bear, but, uh, they kind of, they lost interest because of, uh, you know, sitting a bear bait can be pretty boring. <laughs> so, uh, they got, they, they, they underestimated my commitment to bear hunting. So we, I <laughs> would take them out at three o'clock and sit on a bait barrel and it doesn't get dark up here until almost 10 this time of year. And so, uh, I, I think I wore them out, but other than that, Outside of taking my girls, um, yeah, I'll go here and there with my buddies or family or, or whatever, and 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 it's always fun. I always love it. It's always a great memory. Uh, mm-hmm. But but my heart is is in that solo hunting camp for sure, and and I don't think that'll ever change. So you, you know, another another aspect of solo hunting that is very unique is when you're hiking early in the morning, like I'm talking 435 and you're huffing and puffing, you're pretty loud in the woods. Right. Mm -hmm. And you look up with, you turn your headlamp on or you look up and it's different when you're alone, when you see glowing eyes in the woods, Uh um, that gets a little unnerving sometimes. And that definitely makes you like click your poles together and, or, or yell a little bit, get them, get, get get those eyes elsewhere. But, uh, also, um, when you bust grouse, when you're totally alone, you almost, uh, almost shit your pants. (laughs) I know there's, there's this Facebook meme. Somebody put, I think my buddy Jacob put it out there recently that like, if, if I, if you ever find me dead in the woods, just, you know, without any kind of, Hey, you just laying there dead. No reason why it's a heart attack from a grouse. (laughs) <laughs> and yeah. they, they've been getting me when I, when I was in middle school, 
uh, me and my buddies would get together, and if if we thought some girl was cute, we'd go toilet paper her house, right? And I don't think you can get away with doing this anymore. But this was a thing that a lot of people did back back in the day, you know. And and we, I remember this this one time we were sneaking through this alfalfa field to get uh, get to this girl's house at yeah, you know, midnight. We're gonna toilet paper the house. And for those of you that don't know, toilet papering is when you take a roll of toilet paper or, or, or 12 rolls of toilet paper and you unroll it all over the yard and just you throw it over the house, you throw it in the trees, and it just makes a mess. And um, <laughs> anyways, we're, we're going through this alfalfa field uh, just, you know, through starlight. The moon wasn't even that bright. And it wasn't – it actually wasn't grouse. These were pheasants that jumped up oh, in wow. front of me, and we went over, like, you, you've been bowling and seen the bowling pins all fall over at the same time when the ball hits them. That's kind of what we were. It, it, they it, Like, for some reason, they just exploded in front of us, and we're kids, you know, and we all just, like, fall over. It was the funniest <laughs> dang thing. Um, it scared the crap out of us. But, yeah, those things still get me here 30-some-odd uh, oh, thir- yeah. years later from, from middle school, and, and they still get me heart attack. It, they even get me oh, on the property, dude. They're all over the it, property here. Oh, nice. Oh, really? Yeah, huh. yeah. Try I'll have to come up there uh, during grouse season. You you might have to. You might. I I got one with uh, my bow last year, and put mm-hmm. it put it on my tailgate. I and I I went over to, to I don't know why I was getting something to to process this grouse out, and my freaking bird dog comes over and steals it and eats the whole thing. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you thanks. got one of those huh thanks dick <laughs> thanks dick yeah yeah, totally stole yeah. It. so He's anyway like, cool cool yeah. thanks for the bird appreciate that man <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah yeah he's a savage but um well let's talk about this Pittman robertson thing man um can you give us like a, a bird's eye view of what this bill is trying to achieve and and we can start there and we'll kind of go from there yeah, so uh, Georgia Congressman, as you'd mentioned, his name is Andrew Clyde, um, and uh, about 57 sponsors, I believe now, which oh, includes, it's gone up. Yeah, it includes Idaho's Representative Fulcher as a co-sponsor, uh, introduced um, what they call the Return Act, and that stands for Repealing the Excise Tax on Unalienable Rights Now Act. Um, and which would eliminate the federal excise on firearms and uh, excise tax on firearms and ammunition and bow hunting equipment. It also removes or it significantly reduces the tax um, applied to fishing gear, which is that uh, excise tax is comes from the Dingle Johnson Act of 1950s tax on fishing gear that goes towards fisheries management. Um, and of course, the excise tax on on the federal on firearms and ammunition came from um, the Pittman Robertson Act, mm-hmm. and that is uh, that that money goes. Both of those funds um, go towards uh, on the ground wildlife conservation efforts. About 80 percent of it is passed directly through to state wildlife agencies based on a formula. That has that considers acres of habitat um, combined with how many licenses are sold in the state. So states like Idaho, uh, Western states in general, tend to benefit from it um, in an outsized manner because uh, we don't have the license sales tax base that more populated states do. So yeah. we actually get a, a larger, uh, a good portion of money um, that just benefits us in a way that it doesn't benefit the smaller states. So anyways, that, 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 those funds are go, they go directly to on the ground um, habitat measures, but they also fund uh, sh- hunter recruitment, hunter ed and shooting sports recruitment and shooting sports facilities. Sorry. Shooting like a facilities. shooting range. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So your, so your public go, shooting range, uh, you, you know, things like that, public education, or uh, I'm sorry, like you said, hunter education, I, I just just to chime in in, in a very simplified manner, because I, I actually, when this bill came up, uh, I, I had a couple of emails come in that were asking that, like, there's, hunters didn't even know what the Pittman-Robertson Act yeah. was kind of thing, and, you know, in a nutshell, guys, what that is, is there is an 11% tax on, like, your your long rifles, your hunting rifles, your ammunition, your archery equipment. There's a 10% tax on, on guns, or I'm sorry, handguns and ammunition, and I believe it's 11% on the, um, 
uh, the fishing gear. Is that is that correct? Is it 11? That is correct. Yeah. yeah. And so oh, all yeah, that, 11 or 10 percent on fishing gear. Yeah. Yeah. So all that goes into a fund, guys. It, it, it goes into a, a, a national fund that goes to the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, and they distribute that money uh, to all 50 states for for habitat improvements. It's been there for a long time. You don't personally pay the tax when you go buy a rifle. It's paid by the manufacturer prior to mm-hmm. it getting to the store in which you're buying it at. But these this money has been – this has been going on for 85 years or so. Uh, President yep. Roosevelt signed it into mm-hmm. law in 1938. Um, and so it's got a long history. In fact, in my opinion, in terms of um, how the federal government has a tendency to manage money, in my opinion, they have done the best job at managing the Pittman-Robertson money uh, mm-hmm. out of any other fund. You know, you, you compare it to like Social Security or something along those lines. <laughs> this is a this is a success story. It's a success story for a federal government. It's a success story for hunters and anglers. It is a success story for conservationists. Uh, it, it is a um, wildly important fund that gives us not only the conservation funding necessary to do what we've been doing and maintain the habitat and wildlife, but it also gives us a huge edge in on in protecting this thing that we love, which is hunting and fishing. And so I just wanted to clarify that part real quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're the expert, though, when it comes to this kind of stuff, Brian. So, like, if, if I miss something, go ahead and chime in now. No, I'll, I'll reiterate the uh, – it, it is probably of, of any political issue under the sun in the United States, it's probably the most successful federal-state partnership program in mm-hmm. existence. It's done – what it is set out to do and continues to do that to this day. I couldn't it agree is the more. Fund, it, it is the fund once enacted, we were able to start re, um, funding wild or wetland habitat restoration. It brought back white tails. It funded turkey restoration and habitat. Um, it funded, I mean, ducks, all the things that we hunt today were not doing well elk. in the 20s, 30 elk deer, yep. I mean, white tail almost went extinct we had less than a million less like and, and, and yeah. significantly less than a million. It, it was um, like it was somewhere around a half a million at the uh, yeah. in the 1920s um and right. and now we have what over 30 million throughout the yeah. united states that, that's a huge yeah job. yeah in your neck of the woods i mean they're it's like uh they're like squirrels uh you know they're all over the place <laughs> tell me about it man i got a huge buck showing up on my property and he sneaks by us while we're at the campfire because i have all these cameras so i could track him in real time where he is on my property and he's a he's oh, a dandy cool. anyway i don't oh. get me don't get me sidetracked on these big oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, as soon as, and as soon as the opener comes around he's out i'm sure oh yeah um, he'll be he'll be in a different zip code <laughs> So it's it's a it's a wildly successful program. It was also back in the day, it was self-imposed by sportsmen. It was lobbied, it was advocated at the grassroots up level, every state in the country, including by organizations like IWF. In fact, this was this is this past a, about a year and a half, two years after many of the state federations, which were like the first sort of wave of conservation sporting advocates across the country. Every state had a federation model. Some of them are in different places now. And um, but uh, as far as like their you know robustness of their programs or number of employees, all that kind of stuff. So, anyways, it's this was like one of the original like bedrock. We need to keep the, it was it was very supported wildly successful and that's kind of the reason one of the biggest uh, problems probably with this bill and one of the most upsetting things about representative fulcher signing on is that based on its success based on its popularity um there was no outreach done to the impacted stakeholders the sportsman community uh, yeah, or exactly heads up, exactly or heads up that this was coming and that we're really taken aback by that that that's not the way that we should be making policy in this country that has been that has been a theme this year in 2022 this this legislative i don't know what's going on but we keep getting surprised where mm-hmm. where I feel like in years past we kind of know generally what they're going to be bringing to the table and and like the, I had no idea I didn't even know that uh, a any legislator w- throughout the entire country thought that it would be a good idea to gut one of the most successful conservation funding programs the world has ever known not just our country the, like w- this this 
Pittman Robertson, that the entire tax system that is that is centered around this and the conservation benefits that come out of it is the envy of the world. Other countries yeah. look at it and say, we need to do something like this and put something like this in place. And I'm going to, b- before I get too fired up, <laughs> I'm I'm going to take a step back and just say, I, th- this is not a place, I, I, it's not about like politics. Anybody who listens to my show knows damn well where I sit. And I, I am very much on the right side of the aisle. I'm a small government guy. I, I'm a very conservative indiv- individual. And I don't make any excuses, bones, or apologies about it. But this is coming from the right. And I am embarrassed at my party for even introducing this legislation. I'm embarrassed that we have an Idaho representative who I want to come on my show and and explain why he feels that this is something even... uh, uh, Let me put it to you this way, Brian, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but of all the things we're dealing with, we've got inflation out of control, we've got interest rates rising, we've got... we're, We're darn near on the brink of World War III here. That goes back and forth. We've got all these issues going on. Why are they doing this now? What What... How is this something that should be prioritized over everything else that we've got going on within the country, not just Idaho? I mean, the the whole country. Yeah, it's when I heard when we heard about it, it was just one of those things where the air just gets let out of your lungs. You're like, why? Why now? Why this? Like, it it seems like a waste of time. But I, I, I let me also preface what I'm about to say. There is no shortage of bad ideas from either political party. Um, <laughs> Very true. You know, so there's no monopoly on on good ideas or bad ideas. Um, yeah. And 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 what I think that all sports are not going to get caught up in. This goes back to our original conversation about why or is it so hard to get sportsmen on the same page and just to talk to each other. I think we forget. I think when we people say, well, I'm going to criticize Fulcher over this thing, all of a sudden you're you're not a Republican. And it's just like, no, that's not it. Uh, yeah, like, that's, it's no, I, like, I, I, and, I and have. Frank, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I cut you off. Oh, I, I just think that it's like, in my opinion, you know, I grew up playing organized sports, as I'm sure you did and many other well-rounded people. Um, sure. But what you learn is that criticizing your own team, evaluating your own weaknesses and bad decisions is, in my opinion, the most vital thing that you should be doing. And it's easy. Yes, we should always call out the other team if they're cheating or if they're doing this. You think they, you know, keeping with the sports reference here. But ultimately, if you lose the game, it's because of your it's your own team's fault. Um, And so it's okay to criticize our own folks that are on our team. In fact, it's probably more appropriate to do so <laughs> oh i totally uh, agree how how is progress made mm-hmm. if we don't criticize our own thing our own our own team uh yeah. and and i i have been critical of uh fulcher for for quite some time because of some stances he's taken with public land and and this is just mm-hmm. kind of like an an added little bonus of disappointment that uh an idaho legislator that that lives amongst a state so full of of outdoorsmen like let me ask you this and i don't mean to pick on just fulcher here but um because mm-hmm. because i i really if anybody's listening to this that that has a way to get this message to represent the fulcher to have him come on the show to explain himself i because i always hate when i am kind of picking on one legislator or, or another and they they're not there to defend themselves that that window that 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 door is open that opportunity is there I am here, Jim at the Western Huntsman.com, Jim at the Western Huntsman.com. Thousands of Idahoans <laughs> listen to this show, and uh, as well as a lot of other hunters and anglers throughout the country, uh, come on my show. And one dude in like uh, Indonesia uh, or whatever. <laughs> and so um, the, the point is, or the question I have for you, Brian, is like, uh, you do what you do. You have a lot of exposure to a lot of different hunters and personalities. I, I, I'm kind of in the same position with doing what I do. Do you know any hunters? Uh, let's just take the anglers out of it for a minute, um, because mm-hmm. most of us, you know, just kind of bleeds over anyway. Um, do you know any hunters that support the dismantlement of the Pittman Robertson Act? Uh, personally, I do not. To be frank, I am not. Me neither. It, it's, it's one of those things where it's like it's as fundamental to like uh, to hunting if you know about it. If anyway, if you're if folks are aware of Pittman Robertson, it's just one of those things where it's like, yeah, it's great. Like it, you don't 
it's like, did you pack uh, your shells or did you bring your boots to go hunting? It's just one of those things that's it's maybe in the back of your mind. You're so accustomed to it being around because it's just so integral to what to your lifestyle that mm-hmm. I've never even heard anybody say that they out loud that like, you know what I love? I love that Pittman Robertson. It's just one of those things. It's like, yeah, it's I need it. We need it. It's around it, it, someone not supporting it would be um, like someone slapping you in the face with a, <laughs> it. It's just it's yeah. weird. If you're anything like me, you're always looking for ways to improve your elk hunting skills for September. And one of my favorite ways is the Elk Collective. It's an absolute game changer in self-education. This virtual elk hunting course has over 150 videos that cover everything from elk calling, strategy, tips, setup, gear, much, much more. There's a bunch of people involved, some of the best elk hunters in the woods are involved with the Elk Collective and they've come together to put together this virtual course to help you notch more tags in September. So check it out at theelkcollective.com and use promo code, all one word, the Western Huntsman for 20 bucks off the entire course. That makes the course only $69. It's a great deal and I promise if you go through this course, you will go into the Elk Woods with a lot more confidence and a much better chance at notching a tag on the mighty Wap. Hoffman Boots is the boot choice of the Western Huntsman podcast, and it has been for a very long time. I love my Hoffman in the Explorers, in the 6-inch or the 8-inch. Uh, they have all sorts of options for you to check out. Hoffman Boots is my go-to boot because I am a firm believer that when it comes to gear, the one piece of gear you don't want to skip on is boots get really good boots and if you choose to do some hoffman boots you're going to find out why i highly recommend these hunting boots made by a multi-generational family of shoemakers these boots are made right here in north idaho and i've got an excellent deal for you if you choose to go with hoffman boots use promo code all caps lock huntsman 10 for 10 percent off get you some of these boots and find out why i love them Uh, They're totally waterproof. They're going to give you great traction on the mountain. They're super comfortable. There's very little break-in period. Can't recommend hopping boots enough. Check it out, guys. Next on the list is Scree Gear. High-octane hunting attire without breaking the bank. You want to go into the field with good camo, right? You want want camo that works, that'll keep you dry, that'll keep you comfortable. You want layering systems, the merino wool, the rain gear, all the things that make hunting a little bit easier and allows you to stay in the field a lot longer. The problem with most of it is it's super expensive, not with Scree Gear. Scree Gear will give you all the high-end technical gear that you want without having to take out a second mortgage, and that's why I like it. And to make it even better, I've got a promo code, the Western Huntsman, all one word, and that will give you 15% off and free shipping. It's a heck of a deal, guys. I recommend checking out like their bundle packages. They have like the elk bundle or the whitetail bundle or the turkey bundle. All those bundles come with multiple pieces of gear, and you won't regret getting this gear. It's great stuff. Check out Scree at ScreeGear.com. Oh, and you want to call in an elk? Use Phelps Game Calls. I've been using Phelps Game Calls since uh, just about the beginning of Phelps Game Calls. It's a great company story, too. This company started in a little garage and is now one of the premier call companies on uh, within the industry. I mean, you can't you can't go wrong with Phelps Game Calls, whether it's turkey calls, predator calls, waterfowl, or especially I think the bread and butter is the elk calls. And I, I use the Maverick. I use the Pink. I use the Gray Amp. Uh, Check out the AMP series. If you're new to calling, I recommend getting a couple of different ones and trying them out. Find out which one works best for you. But uh, I promise you I'm not steering you wrong when it comes to Phelps Game Calls. It's a great company full of great people that make excellent products that actually work. And the proof is in the pudding. Call in a lot of elk, and you will too if you trust me, by going to phelpsgamecalls.com. Obviously, i got a promo code for you, right? Huntsman 10. Huntsman 10 for 10% off your Phelps Game Calls and check them out. Phelps Game Calls. Get them close. Two last items. Check out the Reveal Cell Cams from Tacticam. Whether it is for hunting or security, these are excellent cell cams that I have all over my property. To include, I uh, I put them on some job sites for some security so people I know if, uh, if they're stealing materials or whatever, I'm going to catch them. 
Uh, and another little promo code I like to throw out there is for Baitum907 for anybody that is hunting bears spring or fall and you are allowed to bait. Don't forget to go to Baitum907.com. Since made in Alaska, use promo code HUNTSMAN10 for 10% off. The stuff works, and it works well. Let's get back to the show. Here we go. Yeah, I know nobody that is would, would be in support of this, and, and I, I've seen... I've seen the comments. There's a lot of outrage over it, but I'm also concerned that there's not enough outrage over it. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I've said this many for many years, uh, Jim. I think sportsmen had a reason to unite across the country in the 20s and 30s, and they got shit done. Mm-hmm. We we uh, we formed the General Wildlife Assembly. We got Pittman Robertson. Um, you know, uh, Idaho's first citizens initiative was passed by a, a campaign that was run by the Wildlife Federation, which formed our commission form of wildlife management. It took power of managing wildlife away from the legislators of Idaho. And now, of course, that's being clawed back by the legislators. But that we we organized and we changed our country and the way that we hunt and fish and manage those species. Um, I think we have been complacent and um, I think we've taken democracy, frankly, for, for granted on a number of issues. But I think that sportsmen in general and our interests, we have just like kind of taken our hands off the wheel here. And and, uh, and I think that we forget that we really got to we really got to be involved. So can you can you offer some like perspective on. From the standpoint of one of one of the things that we deal with a lot on this show, we what we try to or make an attempt to deal with is this fight against the anti-hunting movement. Mm-hmm. For me, the Pittman Robertson Act gives us a, a a very valuable bag of credibility or mm-hmm. a leg to stand on. I I don't know what the right little you know term to use there, but but what I, what I'm trying to get at is. As as hunters and anglers, this tax, when you combine it with the license sales of, of you know hunting and fishing licenses and whatnot, um, mm-hmm. we have a lot of power and sway because of the funding that that provides. Correct. You, we 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 fund these habitats. We fund these these projects and and wildlife issues and and, and things that 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 make. What, what our objective is is conservation, and, and conservation is, is, is a big thing that is combined of you know wildlife management, habitat improvement, mm-hmm. public land access, all these things that, that, that are super important to us. What impact do you think losing the Pittman-Robertson Act uh, would have on our – for some reason, I'm totally drawing a blank on the word I'm trying to use here – our sway, our, our influence yeah. uh, in, in the fight against the anti-hunting movement. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it totally does. Uh, you know, and that was very purposeful back in the day, when, especially when there was more – a larger percentage of the population hunted and fished. We decided very consciously that with this user pays model should be funding it in multiple aspects, not just hunting and fishing license sales – um, but also through Pittman Robertson and a number of other actual uh, uh, sources. But um, it does, as you have said, it gives us a bit of um, it's like how the cattle industry has a lot of sway over, for instance, the Beef Commission. Yeah. Um, you know, it's they're funding it or and, and it but and, that, and the work the Beef Commission does, I mean, like it, it helps the industry and, and you know, there's. It's sort of like, and, and hunting and fishing is not, well, it is an interesting industry for guides and outfitters or gun manufacturers, boat. Ma- so anyway, there's a, I should say, there's a large industry around hunting and fishing. It's not as well organized, I should say, as like the beef industry or potato industry, any, all those things. But as you're saying, it because we're the funding source, there is an acknowledgement that these people have a bit more say um, in the direction of the resources that they themselves are providing. Yeah. Right. Yep. So, you know, we have the ability when anti hunters are like, oh, we think this should happen. It's kind of it's easy for us to laugh it off and just be like, well, you know, put your money where your mouth is on that. And they don't. Yeah. Um, so we um, it does kind of give us a direct link um, and a bit more political um, weight, I should say. Yeah. And, political and, weight. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and uh, the thing about this bill. You know, and, and actually, I, I am one of these people who believes there 
is a place for additional maps replacement like this bill does. And we'll get into the, the details of what this bill does. But uh, I, I believe that there is room for additional funding sources for conservation in general. It doesn't necessarily have to be wildlife conservation. But, and I don't know what the right mechanism is, but there's one bill I really like that was called the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, um, which would fund um, the state's state wildlife action plan. It's called a swap. It's identified like 100 something species, 200 something species that are basically about they're on their way to being endangered. Um, that the funding for that is mostly non game species, but they're species that are threatened on their way to endangerment. But so there are some game species, bighorn sheep, goat, salmon steelhead, grouse, sage mm -hmm. grouse, uh, mm -hmm. carp tails, a few others. But mostly it's non game. Sportsmen in Idaho, at least, fund all of that non game work. Yeah. And I think that there's actually room for another revenue source to help fund non-game management, but I don't, I wouldn't want to eliminate any sportsman funding coming through. So no, I um, wouldn't either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. It, it's because I mean it would decouple, and this is what anti-hunters have tried to do for a long time. They've tried to decouple hunting influence on and, and firearm influence on wildlife management, and and. It, it's expected, in, in my estimation, that the anti-hunting organizations in America will be strongly supporting this bill behind the scenes, perhaps even openly, um, as they know that if they can, as I said before, decouple the funding of state wildlife agency wildlife restoration projects from the funds generated from firearm sales, it will significantly damage hunting in our nation and the influence hunters have on on game management. And that is a Agreed. that is a serious worry in, in my estimation. And <clears throat> frankly, after my conversations with Fulcher's staff, I do not think um, that is something that they considered. I, I, I don't know how, but I, I, I would agree with that. I think that they don't they don't understand the repercussion of maybe they're not maybe they're not big time hunters. I, I don't know if Fulcher hunts. I, I don't know if this Clyde guy hunts. I, I don't know. I but don't know. I, I can't I, I imagine mm -hmm. that. A legislator could look at this and think that, oh yeah, this is going to be good for hunters and anglers. This is going to be good for for uh, people that are, you know, they their lifestyle is the outdoors. Uh, because w w when I look at this, when I try to describe this to people, you know, it's not it's not the PETA member that saves our wildlife and puts all this funding into conservation. It's not the uh, right. bird watching vegan wildlife photographer that. <laughs> brings wildlife species from the brink of extinction to, in some cases, overpopulated. Uh, th th that is not where that comes from. The funding from this comes from us, and we are the ones that hold that torch. And I like being the only ones that do. You mentioned that you, you'd you be open to some other funding ideas or whatever. I get that to an extent, but I also really like the fact that hunters and anglers hold the lion's share of this funding yeah. that go into wildlife conservation. And I, I hear people complain sometimes that, well, you know, those, uh, what I just said, the, the, the bird watching wildlife photographers, the nature hikers, the mountain bikers, the people that go and enjoy our public lands, you know, they don't pay their fair share, which I don't think is exactly true. Uh, mm -hmm. They just don't pay the share to the magnitude that we do. And I right. like having that. I like having that, uh, it's not a crutch. I like having that advantage. The 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 idea that hunters and anglers are the ones that are on the forefront of protecting these wild places, these public lands, these wildlife species, the habitat improvement projects, all these things that go into uh, what what we put into this package of conservation. It really is hunters and anglers that fuel most of mm -hmm. this. And so I I I like that. I I I would, in my opinion, if I were king of the world, Brian. It would it would stay that way uh, yeah. because I, I feel like it gives what you mentioned earlier. It gives us a lot of political sway and a lot of political influence when it comes mm -hmm. to fighting these um, these hostile vegan anti hunting folks that uh, that want our lifestyle to end that. Yeah. The star childs of the world. Is yes. What you, mean. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I have lots so of names for them. But. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that. I, that was one of the kindest ones I could think of. The um, I, you know, I I. I I guess I, I want to add a point of clarification. Like, so on additional funding mechanisms, um, you know, there's often there's been this idea. They've, it's generally called like the backpack tax, which in my estimation would actually. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Hunters. Yep. It would, it would tax hunters again, which I don't necessarily 
philosophically agree with. But the point the, the idea is like, well, should hunters be paying for all trail maintenance, right? Like, is there another way that everyone who enjoys the outdoors can benefit the upkeep of it in some way? It doesn't have to be wildlife conservation. I would, you know, it, it could be like, um, yeah, like trail maintenance, a bunch of the other things that we need out in the woods, mm-hmm. uh, fire abatement measures. It would be great for ha- to have other funding sources for that kind of stuff, which is chronically underfunded at the moment. So I guess when I say other funding sources, I really mean as a general, not just wildlife, but conservation concept. There's room for other potential sources for a number of issues. But when it comes to this issue, uh, taking it away is just um, that's a non-starter. Yeah, period. totally a non-starter. And, totally and there a non-starter. Is, there is, if you look at, and this this was verbalized by um, Fulcher's staff. And and by the way, the, the the staffer I work with down here is a really good guy. Uh, uh, he's his dad is a state representative. Um, he he does hunt. He knows his guns, and um, mm-hmm. he understands where we're coming from. Um, but he also works for the congressman, and so. What the, the reasoning, which not only was expressed to me, and it's no secret because this is also uh, characterized in Fulcher's outreach as well as uh, Congressman um, Clyde's outreach on this bill, they're saying like two things. One, this is a Second Amendment issue for us. We shouldn't, and and we shouldn't be taxing um, products that fulfill our unalienable rights. Um, and then the other one is, well, look, hey, we're replacing. Pittman Robertson um, with this with eight hundred million dollars up to eight hundred million dollars with oil and gas revenue receipts generated from public land and offshore oil and gas drilling. Oh, that's exactly what we need. Something to increase gas prices. (laughs) Yeah. Great idea. Great idea. guys. Yeah. Can we. There's there's some serious there are some serious concerns with well, with both of those, I'd say brief. Let let me let I want to dissect those two things, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, I'd love to. That's what that's what I was going to ask. Let's start on the unalienable rights thing. Mm-hmm. Um, we already know it's it's not unconstitutional to tax things that the Constitution gives us rights of, like guns. If if that were true, you know, if this if this bill, which I, I understand where they're coming from, like I, I get that messaging, but if they were interested in going after all of the things that the Constitution says are rights, um, that we shouldn't tax any of those free market products. I shouldn't have to pay tax on paper, on ink, on, you know, making flyers. Uh, the, you know, newspapers shouldn't have to pay for anything that, you know, the First Amendment, the right to express yourself and freedom of the press and all that kind of stuff. Why doesn't this bill also get rid of all the ex- excise taxes on all the products that allow us? So, Jim, your podcast is an expression of your First Amendment, right? Mm hmm. If this, you know, why should you have to pay tax on any of your equipment, on any of your, you know, so it's like, okay. Yeah, it's the same thing. You know how much tax I pay to keep this podcast going? <laughs> I <Right>. mean, <laughs> it's not, it's not crazy high, but I, I mean, there, there are taxes paid. And so it, it, you, it, your point is super valid. The other, the other thing that the, the unalienable right and the second amendment issue is a separate issue from taxes. And, and I am, I am for the most part opposed to most taxes. I, I am opposed to a lot of taxes that we pay. I think we, as Americans, we do pay too much in tax. My my income, um, it's sad what I what I write checks to the federal government for. It's ridiculous, in fact, uh, and and I find it in many cases to be theft. I don't find the issue of taxing a firearm from the, direct from the manufacturer to the federal mm-hmm. government. Uh, an infringement on my right to bear arms. I'm sorry, they're not telling me I can't own the firearm. They're they're not. Yeah. Nobody is stopping me from owning the firearm. Things cost mm-hmm. money. We have to have this funding in place. This is a mo. I mean, it just blows my mind. I still don't understand. <laughs> like Social Security is going broke, but yeah, let's let's deal with Pittman Robertson, the successful one. Yeah. Uh, it just it just right. it, it it freaking. I'm trying to watch my mouth. I'm trying to watch my mouth. Yeah. Um. Well, here's, you know, here's the thing about this, too. The, the Sixth Amendment guarantees your, uh, you know, the rights to a criminal defendant, including the right to public trial, yep. the right to a lawyer, impartial jury, all that. And yet we still have to pay taxes um, to the fees we pay our lawyers. Uh, we have to pay for the court fees. I mean, there are many things that are constitutionally protected that we have to pay taxes on. And yet this bill only goes after Pitt and Robertson. And Eagle Johnson. So that's the other thing here is that, okay, this is a Second Amendment issue for you guys. Why the hell 
is it touch why is it touching the Dingle Johnson Act? Exactly. Which is the fishing the fishing excise taxes, which pays for a lot of fisheries. Um, that you know, and and uh, I don't want to really divulge too much of my private conversation with Fulcher's staff, but I think there's just kind of a put the hands up in the air and just said, you know, we didn't write the bill. Um, and that's I'll leave it at that. And I'm just saying, well, yeah. it just to say that this is like going protecting the Second Amendment when it goes obviously beyond that, um, it falls. It just doesn't. It's, it rings a little hollow to me. It's 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 completely baseless. It, it, and and this is coming from a, I am a I am one of the most staunch Second Amendment rights advocates you will ever meet. I mean, I will I will die defending the Second Amendment. OK, so so I don't want anybody to misplace where my priority is. So for somebody to tell me that this is an infringement on my Second Amendment right by having this tax and I'm disagreeing that I, I, you, there's there's got to be something there that that can help people that may not understand this issue fully um, that says that that is bullshit. Mm-hmm. That it is that that is bullshit. There are plenty of things when we're talking about the second amendment that we should be concerned about. It's that saying, I got 99 problems. The, the Pittman <laughs> Robertson act is not one of them when it comes to the second amendment. I'm sorry. It's just not there. It's, it's bullshit. Pardon my French. There's no other mm-hmm. way to put it. It's just another political ploy to give it some kind of fake credibility so that they can market this BS bill and try to get it shoved through and, and, and have people and constituents be okay with it. I don't buy it. Yep. This is why I don't trust politicians. I'm embarrassed it comes from the party that I've always supported. Uh, and it, it's just I, – to, to say that it is an infringement and a, and a threat to the Second Amendment is a lie. You're, mm-hmm. you're lying to me, and I, I, I know, Brian, that in your position, you've got to tread a little bit more lightly than I do. But I will call these politicians out. They're, they're lying when they say it's an infringement on our Second Amendment. Sorry. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's been in existence since 1937, and it's not stopped me from getting all the guns and ammo that I want or need. Exactly. Um, and probably everybody listening out there is, like you said, um, there's some people who don't even know it exists, and they buy their guns and trade their guns and buy their ammo and have, have gone about their lives. And so I, it's hard to – it's a stretch, I, I believe, to say that it's protecting the Second Amendment, especially yeah. when it goes beyond. And the, the other component of the Second Amendment argument um, is that it was a reaction to uh, a bill that was produced by the far left, which would increase excise taxes on uh, – there are exclusions, but – on, on And it's mostly it's like um, it, this was from the 1934 Federal Firearms Act, which regulated it was in, in first put in place as a two hundred dollar fee on non hunting type guns at the time. So less center fire, no bolt actions, they, all, all that was excluded. And what it was put in place for was to actually curb the uh violence of organized crime in the 20s and 30s the al capone type stuff yeah and um at the time it made automatic weapons very expensive that tax still exists today um and that is something that uh i believe it it, that should be more in the crosshairs than Pittman robertson i almost feel like they're barking up the wrong tree here Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. because you know it's i don't know it it, so they're like well the far left is trying to introduce this bill that's going to increase taxes on those types of weapons and um but one you know i just my response to the fulcher team was this look it sounds like you guys are playing chess with congressional democrats political chess with congressional democrats and all of the stakeholders and interests uh, that care about Pittman Robertson weren't even given a heads up. We're caught in the crossfire here. And frankly, if the left introduces a bad bill, they're not our goddamn idols. We don't need yeah. to mimic them and and also produce bad bills. Um, you know what I mean? Like nothing I, I, good comes out of a reactionary piece of le- legislation. When I hear when I hear for, and, and either both sides do this. OK, so mm-hmm. when I. So they're, they're like, oh, this is this is in response to a bill that the other side did. I always think like, are they your role models? Because it sounds like you don't like what they're doing, yeah. and yet you are mimicking them. And so we need to get away from that. That version of uh, American politics is so aggravating to me. So 
there they can say, well, you know, it's a reaction to this other bill. Well, I, I haven't heard from anybody um, that that bill has a snowball's chance in hell. And maybe and this this bill might not either. But it is concerning when you can get 58 Republicans um, to get on a bill. Absolutely. Uh, Especially an Idaho one. Yeah. And, and frankly, the other the bottom line, what I told Fulcher staff is like, hey, look, um, I didn't pull the trigger on this. No pun intended. And you guys did like come to us. We you guys are always we work well with you guys. I mean, you, we were always we're in good communication. Um, this could have all been avoided. And and frankly, if there's any big, significant changes like this, um, I, I'll, I'll be the first to say there's no such thing as perfect legislation and perfect laws. Sure. Um, but there are ones that are that we can see are, are quite successful and have been modeled around the world, like Pittman Robertson, um, that if you're going to change something that's rather successful, um, you can got to bring people together. And um, this was a not, this is just kind of a, in my opinion, like a knee jerk reaction to, even if it was just that bill, but they're not just responding to that bill. They're clearly trying to make a second amendment argument. And they clearly thought about the impact of Pittman Robertson a little bit because there's this, replacement funding mechanism, which is the other part of that bill, if you wanted to dive into that. Yeah, let's, let's, let's touch on that for a minute, because um, my, my initial reaction to that is it, it, it will never work. The, the leases are untrustworthy to yep. consider as a, as a consistent funding source. It'll never work. So what, what is your takeaway from that? The alternative funding sources are diluted uh, among many programs that are highly dependent upon the political agenda of whoever sits in the White House, oil and gas, extraction production the the you know <laughs> it's just um oil it, it's highly it's politically contentious the act of oil and gas drilling i mean it's not just and that's not a partisan statement it's just it's one of those things right like yeah, some it is. that's versus republicans i guess in that way it is partisan but like why would we put a successful and reliable wildlife funding program like Pittman robertson put the source of those funds in something that can be turned and t- turned off and turned on like a spigot. The reason Pittman Robertson is so um, effective is because it's, you know, it does fluctuate from year to year slightly with gun sales, although gun sales never seem to do poorly, um, yeah. which is great. <laughs> so, it, but it's reliable. Our fishing game agencies can count on that funding Lots, as you likely know, and the listeners know, lots of wildlife restoration projects take years. Mm -hmm. If you can't plan out further than a presidential administration and don't know when certain spigots will be turned off, that's a shit way to manage wildlife. We need constant and reliable funding, and Pittman-Robertson and its current funding source does that. Shifting that generation to oil and gas revenues um, is bad, not only politically, but that's an industry that is sort of all over the place. As we've seen, you know, they have skyrocket. And that, sorry, this this is only political because of our present reality. Yeah. There are sometimes cost incentives for oil and gas companies to not produce at the moment because mm-hmm. they are beholden to shareholders, and that's just any corporation. So it's just that you know, if they can make the same amount of money, the same profits, and not put in the same amount of money into exploration and turning the pumps on all that. They're going to do that until they absolutely have to. That's and that's not unique to that industry. So nobody, you know, shout at me on Twitter or whatever for for daring to say that. That is a free market issue. That is common in any business. Yep. So we are putting at risk needlessly, in my opinion, Pittman Robertson funding by shifting it to that. Not only does it shift it to an unreliable source um, that's politically contentious and market contentious, very politically um, volatile. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's also not even enough. Pittman Robertson and Dingle Johnson last year produced one point five billion dollars with a B to mm-hmm. state wildlife agencies. Uh, and um, their replacement goes up to eight hundred dollars. So not only is it the first part like unreliable, it's not even enough. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, it's not, I, it, it falls short. It falls short. It, it falls short. And. Every diehard hunter and angler knows by looking at the world that more and more people are getting out into the woods. It's harder to find solitude. There's more complex uh, issues facing our wildlife in modern society. Mm -hmm. We don't need 
less uh, uh, resources. Yeah. And, yeah. and frankly, it's just, um, it's to cut it off and to also replace it with a different kind of source. It's just, it's, it was short sighted. And again, something that could have been solved before this bill was drafted, had they come to uh, organized sportsman organizations and, and had a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> The thought of oil and gas, the volatility of that, fighting <laughs> Pittman Robinson just makes my skin crawl. I mean, I, I that whole issue is dumb. The the way <laughs> that I mean, it's just dumb. Like, why do you, why does the right argue against electric cars and the left argues for them? Like, why does it have to be one way or another? Why right. can't there be some gray area? Okay, you know, from my lifestyle, I'm in a very rural area. I, an electric vehicle is not going to work for me, but why? Why is that not a viable thing for many people that don't travel more than ten miles in a day in an urban area in, in, a, right. in a you know metropolitan area like where where that is an electric car is a viable thing? Like why can't there just be both sides relax on that issue? Anyway, that's a whole different. Um, mm -hmm. It drives me crazy. It drives me oh. crazy that people can't just. You know, figure this kind of stuff out. You know, I I, I never want to I, I I never want to agree with uh, the, the left on one thing or another. But when it comes to things like this, I don't ever see Democrats coming out with legislation uh, that get to get rid of Pittman Robertson. But I see them coming out with legislation to ban spring bear hunts, and so I right. can't I can't yep. align there, right? And then I have the other side, who uh, sure they're they're going to be good about my Second Amendment rights, but then they come out with stuff like, well, public lands needs to give it be given back to the state. It was it doesn't belong to the state. It never has, That's and good. it gets rid of the access for everybody. Like shut up, you're embarrassing yeah. yourself and me. I don't want to hear it. Like these programs, the Federal Forest Service. Uh, or I'll just say public lands in general, the you know the BLM lands and, and all that kind of stuff. When it comes to land management, it's like one of the most successful things in American history. When it comes to funding programs, the Pittman Robertson Act is one of the most successful things in American history. Why are we messing with that? It just doesn't it's, make sense. The combination of the opportunity, not only as you say in the intro of your podcast, public lands provide unfragmented habitat for our wildlife. They also provide us the grounds for blue collar people to go out and just hunt. Yeah. And that's a yeah. part of our life coupled with the funding of wildlife management. That is the only reason the people who still hunt. And I'm guessing the people that listen to your podcast get to hunt is our combined system of user pays model for wildlife pursuits Absolutely. and access to public lands that we have. Um, and, and what's mad maddening politically is that you have, the the both sides on the aisle condemning certain aspects of that system while supporting the other and they seem to be just diametrically opposed um, on those two issues which is a bummer and so when i hear one of the biggest grievances i have is um, and this may fall into part of the reason it's so hard for sportsmen to get along with each other is that and and this is probably just a symptom of american society and the two-party system but you have people that are so much more loyal to the uh, idea of what they want the party to be and therefore that directs their vote but we have that system over time has created this polarization in my opinion mm -hmm. and i they're like oh I, you know i'll never vote republicans because they want to depose public lands or i'll never vote for a democrat because they want to get rid of firearms for certain this and it's like all those that is true and that can be a part of their even their party platform the idaho republican party platform in fact includes divestiture of public lands the problem is that there are individual Republicans and there are individual Democrats who don't fall in line with the party uh, line on those issues. Mm -hmm. And those we need to we need to we need to um, uplift. Up. Yeah. Yep. There I you know, and in fact, and I'm not going to name names because as my official capacity is IWF, I can't endorse. And this could be an implicit endorsement of any um, uh, a candidate or party. Um, but there are some people who won their Republican primaries already who are going to be good on public lands issues, which I'm stoked about. That is a sh we have a shortage of of Republicans in the Idaho legislature who support yeah. public lands, and and these are really good guys that I'm very excited to have. Um, rep be kind of edging into that, what we just talked about, um, supporting public lands and shooting sports and wildlife conservation. They're just like, and so they're but they're those, all those intertwined. Guys, 
they're yeah, they're right. So they're not, oh, I'm a Republican first or I'm a Democrat first. They're like, well, I'm a sportsman and I know that wildlife need this and I know that hunters need public land. So why would I, you know, so I like that way of thinking. Those are the people that I like. So yeah. Uh, anyway, that's that's there, a little bit we, we need that. <laughs> we we need that to reduce the polarization in the country. And there's there's uh, what 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 bothers me, I guess, with in terms of the the campaigns and the, and the political messaging and everything else that goes into this. It's also one way or the other. It's also black or white. Like somebody, you know, you're taking a, an issue on like like abortion. You know, that can sway somebody to be voting one way, left Mm -hmm. or right, and they don't even know anything about what political agenda that party might have, but they're in support of or against abortion. And so that's what guides their political views. And and that's what we need to do away with. Uh, And and it's it's ideas like that. And this 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 no gray area thing like, the you know. It's okay to have gas vehicles and electric vehicles. You don't have to have just one or the other, right? Um, it, yeah. It's just it's that kind of stuff. But it, it for, for me, it it blows my mind that we can have politicians on the left or right in the state of Idaho that could be opposed to public land and public land access. I, I, like I'm sorry, we're not all uh, oil tycoons from Texas that can buy up a bunch of land to mm-hmm. hunt on. This is our lifestyle. We depend on these public lands, and you don't have to be a hunter to depend on it. There's a lot of people that don't hunt that enjoy public land. They they go yep. out and they camp. They hike. They do all the things that we enjoy. We just have the added element of, of having a hunting tag in our pocket. It's uh, yeah. I, go ahead. It's, it's one of those. Yeah, they, they they. It's just it's a push to live in a world where like a political purity test, like you need to be black or you need to be white. Yeah. And there's um, but most people are in the gray area. Very few are hundred pure this way or that way. And uh, yeah, our, but our politics don't seem to reward the people in the middle that are like, well, actually, I kind of like public lands. I, I use them to hunt. Why? And but you'll you'll be ostracized then um, and you won't get the funding you need to be elected or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's frustrating. And I'm not even yeah. in the middle, man. I, I am not in the middle. I, I, I yeah. am very much on the right, but I mm-hmm. do. That does not mean that I will discriminate, uh, I, yeah. you know, uh, one way or the other. If I disagree with something like my party, my side is doing because I, I don't agree with everything that Republicans say. And especially mm-hmm. when it comes to public lands or, or mm-hmm. this Pittman Robertson Act, I, like I will full force go after them just as aggressively as I will as a Democrat trying to take my gun rights away or take a spring bear hunting season away. I don't care. I'm non-discriminatory that way. My lifestyle is not to be meddled with by a bunch of government politicians. Sorry. That's, it's just not, it's not how I see or view what living in a free society means. So it, it complicates and muddies waters and, and I, I will fight both parties Tooth and nail to the extent of which I feel like whatever is um, going to achieve the outcome of of me having the freedom to live my life. Don't take away my hunting. Don't take away mm-hmm. my public lands. Don't take away any of that. Just like get out of our hair. Get out of our hair and go away. Yeah. That's, this that's, is going pretty, this like, is going really well for us. Uh, life would be <laughs> – yeah, right? Like life would be just better if you politicians just went away. Go away. Yeah. I don't want to hear from you. Anyway, I, obviously yeah. that's not a reality. So I, I know I, I promised you I'd try to keep this under an hour here. Mm-hmm. Um, which my last, again, yeah, my, I think the last bit of this is like, OK, well, you know, where's nationally? I, I think it's like, where's this bill going? Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, we don't know yet. There doesn't seem to be many other people sort of glomming onto this yet, which is good. Um, I but it's it's worrisome that this is a has so many co-sponsors. Um and totally. uh, yeah, it's it's a reminder to, to like you said, like I said at the beginning of this, like we should be making our own. If if you're a Republican, it's okay to make your own team better. If you're a Democrat, it's also okay to make your own team better. Criticizing a bill is just that. It's not a criticism of of the party or how you stand. And I got people got to get away from that. But yeah, if you need agree. help to to say, okay, I, I maybe I could stand against this there are some powerful allies the freaking the national rifle association has come out against this bill the national shooting sports foundation congressional sportsman foundation i mean all of these pro 2a forward organizations shooting not even necessarily like wildlife centric um are 
all against this bill as well. And so, we, yeah, when you have powerful allies like that, holding hands with, uh, you know, sportsmen and wildlife conservation groups, it's it's they should be paying attention and yep. as to why. Um, and it's it doesn't close the book on what they think should be done. It simply says this book is not the right one. Let's start a dialogue where we're kind of holding the pencil together and, and, and like, you know, even if I just it, it, it just reminds me to come back to this. Like uh, if you want to change something, pretty, especially something as fundamental as Pittman Robertson or something like that, like how do you not how is the first thing you do not go talk to the sportsman in your state? Yeah, uh, you, that should have been the first move. That assumptions was were made. Yes. Yeah. Assumptions were absolutely made because i had heard like what's the big deal like we're replacing this we're replacing the funding it's like well one yeah no you're not to the extent possible that, that we already fund it and two it's this other reliable source so that they just thought it was they thought that they had buttoned that argument up um and that's just not the case it's just yeah oh. not the case at all um i i think that they would uh they just must be out of touch with the um the outdoorsman community, the sportsman community. Yeah. Um, because it's just not a reality that like nobody supports this, that, that is a, a true blue uh, a conservationist hunting angler, uh, hunter or angler. Uh, it, it's nobody supports this. Like th- this yeah. is ridiculous. And what, what my fear is, Brian, um, is like, I, I don't think that this will, it, it's, it's essentially, I wouldn't say it's dead on arrival, but I don't mm-hmm. think it can get through right now. But my, what my fear is, is they don't have a big enough negative reaction to this mm-hmm. right now, and if the GOP comes in and swaps power in the legislature, you know, this this November mm-hmm. or whatever, it could be a problem next year, right? Yeah. So it's I don't I don't know that it's a huge threat this year, but it, it kind of gives us a peek into the future of what maybe some intentions are next year, and so I feel yeah. like hunters and and to those of you guys listening to this, I know. That this year has been a lot. We we have asked a lot. Um, we've had issues with with our friends in California and our friends in uh, uh, Washington yeah. dealing with spring bear hunts and anti hunting legislation throughout the country and and trapping legislation, bad trapping legislation throughout the country. And and so I've been asking a lot, you know, of of taking action. I know we all get burned out. I know I do. I get burned out. I, I just want to talk hunting, man. I just want to come mm-hmm. on this show. And have a good time talking about hunting stories and telling, you know, getting tips and advice and providing all that. And, you know, that's that's really what I want to do. But we can't have those discussions without having these discussions because this is what our future is based on. So if you're listening to this, action needs to be taken. And the I'm hoping Brian can, can help us point us in the right direction here. The one place that I know that, that'll make it easy, you can jump on howforwildlife.org if you guys aren't members. Um, I'm... I know that they – all that what, – all you have to do is click buttons on that, and it's going to send like a generic email. And it's great because they, they – I think they do see that. But I, I feel like we need more than just stuff like yeah. that because I, yeah. I – like an individual email that you articulate and come up with yourself or a phone call that you make or a letter that you send yourself is going to have a uh, magnified result over something like – just sending out a bunch of emails from from one place. Does that make sense? Oh, I don't yeah. know if I'm explaining uh, that right. So we need to do yeah, both is what I'm saying. Absolutely. I, mean, I, I, I wouldn't be much of an executive director if I didn't uh, pitch, pitch IWF and the more encompassing work that is involved. So groups like Howl, groups like IWF, we have the software that makes it very easy for you to click a few buttons to send a letter. Um, that's important. They, they do tally that, even if it's like a similar ma- – we, we provide like skeleton language to mm-hmm. everyone. If you have time to click a few buttons, fine. We want you to get your voice heard and out there. They do tally that stuff. If you want, you can you can change it. I mean, shit, we, you can change it to be like, I support this bill. We, we don't care. But we always – we usually know that pe- – where people are on these issues. And even if there's one out of 100, that's still fine. So yeah. they, they do – they do keep a tally of how many people are coming in, uh, letters are coming in. The other important aspect of this is like they, their phone numbers, calls make a big difference. They keep tallies of those as well. Um, IWF works to patch people through on certain issues to congressional offices. 
Um, you know, that takes resources. It takes resources to get, um, you know, we work with all of Idaho's reporters and regional reporters to get this news out because reporters, they don't know about, I mean, like they rely pretty heavily on press releases and calls to let them know that shit's going down. Mm -hmm. So yep. we have to maintain relationships with them. Um, oftentimes in IWF, like we have really great relationships with Idaho uh, papers. They come to us for a lot of this stuff. When when congressmen start hearing their name or seeing their name in the papers, then they know that millions of people are starting to see their actions. Mm -hmm. They start to a little bit. There's also accountability. There's get out the vote. There, that's 50C3. You know, we're a 501C3 organization, so we can't tell people how to vote or what to vote. But the, the implication is, of course, that like people are starting to know about this stuff, and so it takes more than just an email. That's an important part of it. But um, organizations like IWF have staff. We're working with the congressmen. We're trying to show them. We work to get this. We, we try to turn this into a much bigger issue. And when it comes to an issue as bedrock as Pittman Robertson, I'm going to use a, a, a easier term here. You have to make it hurt. If you don't Absolutely. want to meet again in a position where the Republicans might have more power down the road, you have to make it hurt now. I mean, that is what IWF did when uh, the state legislature was considering mandating auctioning off uh, trophy tags for elk, deer, I mean, more because the commission has the authority now, but they only do the one sheep tag. Mm -hmm. The legislature want to make more money and, and allow, you know, wealthier people to kind of cut in line by mandating more auctions happen for more animals, um, sort of drifting towards this Utah model, which is a very dangerous model, in my opinion, and a lot of the membership of IWF, which is a whole other uh, podcast topic, by the way. Yeah, uh, we, we could do that. We could do that yeah, at one point. Yeah, let's, let's put, a, put a button in that. But, um, we we blew that up and frankly it didn't help some of our relationships with important people in the legislature mm -hmm. that are now gone they're they've retired but we made that issue so politically toxic that no legislator has thought about touching it since and that was in 2016 yeah. and Good. Uh, we don't need to go as scorched earth as as we did back in auction tags in Idaho, as we did back then on this issue. Um, we just need to sports and just need to make sh make it be known that this is a toxic issue. And, and you do that by the calls. If you are so inclined, you can also it, this actually makes a difference. Surprisingly, in this tech advanced world, classic letters of the editor, they see it. They know it's getting out there. Say, the say that noise, one more time. What what to the editor? Letters to the editor. Just, oh, a gotcha. quick, just a quick, hey, Fulcher's doing this. I do not support this. I am a hunter. I am from this town. I'm from his district, especially. is very powerful if you're in within their voting district. Mm -hmm. um, there's a number of ways um, that we can implement it. But, uh, you know, I, organizations like IWF, we come up with that strategy. Um, we try to implement it. But always a part of that strategy is grassroots. If we don't prove that people on the ground, normal, everyday, average Idahoans don't support this, then they think that we're just blowing smoke up their ass. So, yeah, um, yeah we, we, but we know that sportsmen are on our side on this. So it's our job, IWF's job to get the word out, folks like you uh, and your podcast to get the word out. But it, it doesn't mean anything if people don't also take action. So that's yep. incredibly important. Um, still in this day and age, it can have an impact. Okay. That's that's really good uh, information, Brian. And so so action items, action items, guys. Um, obviously, jump on jump on IWF. If 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 you're in Idaho and you live in the state of Idaho, you should be um, involved with IWF. It's a great organization. They do a lot of work that is designed to um, you know protect our lifestyle. The mm -hmm. um, how best job in the world. Yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> How for Wildlife. Uh, jump on there, howforwildlife.org. If it's it's free, you sign up and you can send a bunch of letters that way. And all you're doing is signing your name and clicking a button and it sends it for you. Super easy. In fact, on this issue, uh, what I think is funny, and I, I think would be actually pretty powerful. Uh, I I don't know. Is on this particular issue, the Pittman Robertson, uh, or the I'm sorry, well, the the Return Act. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. The uh, you could jump on and and go over to the second tab where it's a fax and you can hit that and and you can kind of and and what 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 would happen if like Fulcher's office got a thousand faxes in one day, <laughs> right? I mean you think about that uh, the the impact on that. Uh, the other thing is you there are 
resources where, well, I mean, IWF has this as well, but ju- just sending emails, sending hard letters, the old-fashioned, you know, buy, buy a stamp and put it in the mailbox, uh, getting information. What was the other one uh, you mentioned? Getting information to the editors of um, – the local in your local papers. Still local works. papers, yeah, yeah, works really well. Um, I I would I would vouch for that. I did that. Uh, I don't know, five or six years ago, made mm-hmm. a difference. Um, so we we just kind of do need to create a ruckus. We need to make it hurt. We need to, you know, I I don't know. Go like like you said. I don't know that we need to go scorched earth just yet. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's it's if if we can squash it now and not have to deal with it next year, our kids will thank us for it in the future. Um, so, yeah. That's the point. You know, yep, we're uh, IWF. Part of the you know the other thing we're doing, we're, we've been educating organized sportsmen uh, groups mm-hmm. uh, around the state where they're signing on to a letter of opposition as we speak. We have a lot of groups that are piling on that. If you belong to one of those organizations, a shooting club, a bow hunting club, a species specific club, whatever it is. Um, reach out to us, you know, idlewildlife.org or all of our contact info is on there. Um, we'll talk to you about any issue, any stance we have on this. You guys will probably find that, I mean, we have a pretty uh, conscientious sportsman forward, wildlife forward view on um, almost everything. And, um, but if your group's not involved, it definitely needs to be, I think I touched on this at the beginning, you know, we, we become complacent and I would love to spend nothing more than just, you know, my whole hour on this podcast, bullshitting about hunting and fishing, but yeah, we that is a uh, a right that we have to continue to fight for, and um, when it's under threat from anybody, regardless of their political um, party, um, we better recognize that um, it is it is really a a privilege to be able to hunt or to talk about hunting in a way, um, and it comes with defense, and we got to defend it. I I love that point because I think that I think that this is something that uh, a lot of people don't understand or might not fully fully grasp in terms of yeah, well let me put it to you this way I expect hunting to be under fire from uh you, you know the the humane society of the United States I expect <laughs> hunting to be under fire from hostile vegans out of Portland Oregon I expect hunting to be under fire from people who just don't have any kind of experience background or passion for the sport and lifestyle that hunting is what I don't expect is an Idaho representative to present something that that guts the Pittman Robertson Act that is one of our major major power points when we're talking not not a powerpoint presentation it, it's just a it, it is a very heavy suitcase that can get slammed onto the conference table in the debate of hunting versus anti-hunting in fact i've written about this to a great extent in uh, in the book that i'm working about or working on that that talks about the impact and the, the benefits of the pittman robertson act and i just don't expect it i i don't think that Somebody like uh, Representative Fulcher sits there and thinks that this could be something that dismantles the hunting and outdoors way of life, right? I don't, I don't think that he looks at it like that. But I do think that, and, and I'm not going to name names, I do think that there could be something to be said for some of these Republicans that are anti-hunting or uh, anti-public land that by gutting something like the Pittman Robertson would help dismantle some public land stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know that's, that's a little bit conspiracy or conspiracy sounding, but a lot of this stuff, we, we just need to make noise. We, we have to have an argument here. We, we have the right information to make a valid argument. There, there's no debating. Yeah. This is not a second amendment issue. This is not an issue where sportsmen are like, uh, you know, hollering about how, how bad it is for us or, or how, how uh, you know, rough it is to have to pay this 11% excise tax on, on uh, firearms and archery equipment. Uh, wh- mm-hmm. Nobody's out there ruffling feathers on that. Everybody is that's, – that's like a badge of honor for most sportsmen. Uh, and, and so it, there's no reason for it. What is mm-hmm. this hidden reason? Well, like why did this even come up? Anyway, point being – Guys, get out there and and make some noise on this, and and let's let's try to squash this. Like like Brian said, make it hurt a little bit, so that uh, we can we can move on and and squash this thing and 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 continue on this legacy. The sportsmen have been long proud to discuss with anti hunters. Mm-hmm. We fund it, we fund the habitat, we fund 
the conservation efforts. We fund the wildlife management, and this is one of the major tools to do that. So, Brian, I, I appreciate you coming on, man. This, is a, this yeah. has been a good conversation. Um, I, I so, sorry we couldn't talk more uh, <laughs> more lighthearted <laughs> stuff. Uh, no, all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, no, I, that was a good, well said on your last points there. I think that's a perfect place to wrap it up. And, and if I can add the last thing here, this is hunting and fishing and our funding. That's one of the things that I'm actually like that America does well. And one of the things that I think about that makes me really proud to be an American, right, is that mm-hmm. we it, anyways, I'm, I'm really proud of this program. I'm proud to be a hunter and angler and to fund this kind of stuff. And so um, this just kind of strikes at my core. And, and I hope it strikes to the core of everybody who's who's listening out there and they feel a, a fire under their butt to, to make a call or send a letter. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll end it on this note, Brian, that, that, that's a great point. Um, but I will end it on this note, guys, if, if there is anybody out there connected to, or if representative Fulcher is actually somehow for some reason listening to this, please come on my show, come on my show and talk about it. I, I want to hear your side of the story because I, again, like I stated earlier, I don't like to just come out and attack without having somebody having the ability to defend themselves, but this needs to be discussed. And so if you are representing the people and, and you have a, a deep uh, belief in this return act, you should come on and justify it to me and, and let's have the conversation and, and see where it goes. So Brian, again, thank you for what you do, not only for uh, IWF, but coming on the show. You're always good to have, always make some really good points, make me feel dumb. And I like that. <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. Anytime we can get the word out on important stuff, I, I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Sounds good. Well, let's keep in touch and you have a great summer, man. All right, you too. Take care. You made it all the way to the end. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. We sure appreciate your support. This is Jim Huntsman signing off and reminding you to check us out at Instagram at The Western Huntsman and on Facebook at The Western Huntsman. And you can also check out the website at thewesternhuntsman.com. Thanks again. We'll see you guys next time. Stay Western, and I'll see you on the mountain.